Have you got the board games covered for tonight? I bought some of your favorites if you don't mind. Awesome. Oh, hang on a minute. I forgot something. Bro. Oh. I can't quite see it. How am I supposed to drive? Who is that buckle? Well, they did say they were fans of really big dice games, you know. Sagrada. Sagrada is a dice rolling, dice placement board game where players take on the role of window artists as they try to craft the most gorgeously kaleidoscopic stained glass windows anyone has ever seen. Players start a game of Sagrada by selecting a window frame and private objective card. Three public objective and three tool cards are placed in the center and players take corresponding favor tokens according to their selected window card. Play begins clockwise as each person performs a selection of the following actions including selecting one die from the draft pool and placing it in an open space in their window and or use a tool card by paying the appropriate number of favor tokens. Placing a die involves placing the first die from the edge of the frame or corner and placing following dice adjacent orthogonally or diagonally from the die already placed. A space with a colored square requires the placement of a corresponding colored die, whilst a gray numbered square requires the corresponding number to be placed only. No two same colors or two same numbers can ever be placed orthogonally adjacent to each other. Play continues in a counterclockwise direction before the next round begins. Players can spend favor tokens to use the tools available to make alterations to their window designs. Sagrada is an abstract board game done really well. Each game provides players with fast, varied and meaningful game choices. It's both addictive and quite well balanced. Players are constantly faced with tough decisions where they have to consider the placement rules of dice, the arrangement of their window frame cards, and whether they actually satisfy the public or private objectives that they're trying to obtain with each dice draw. I think that the placement rules really encourage players to think ahead and picking the right die um, and placing it on your window frame may have consequences later in the late game. I like how the uh, window cards are varied in their level of difficulty and the variation in public objectives and window cards means each game feels really fresh. Blueprints. Blueprints is a dice placement pattern building board game where players take on the role of architects as they try to build the grandest buildings ever using dice. They represent different types of materials as they try to claim various architectural prizes and thus gain the most prestige to become the most famous dice architect ever. A game of blueprints is divided into three rounds. At the beginning of each round, players are dealt one blueprint card randomly which is kept face up behind the player's screen. On a player's turn, they select one die from the dice pool and place it on their blueprint card according to the following dice placement rules. Dice can be placed on an empty space on their blueprint card, or they can be placed on a previous die of equal or lower pip value. Each die taken from the pool is replaced with a die from the dice bay. After each player draws six dice, players score their building constructions by, gaining six points for completing a matching blueprint building exactly, and scoring dice placement for each material used. Awards are handed out to players based on their round score. Prizes are handed out for the players that meet their criteria associated with height, structural integrity, geometry, and material use. The player with the most points from totaling their awards and prizes after three rounds is the winner. Blueprints is ingeniously fun because I love the 3D building and puzzly aspect that this game has to offer. Players are constantly thinking both laterally and vertically in order to try and maximize the points of their score each round. Throughout a round, players are constantly vying for multiple scoring objectives, whether it's using the dice composition of your particular tower to try and get the most points to score architectural awards, or think about dice placement in order to try and score architectural prizes. I like the simplicity of the gameplay, yet it comes with really heavily weighted decision making, and I like the fact that luck doesn't have a severe impact on the outcome or success of a player throughout a game. This game prevents the runaway leader effect, where at the end of each round, the points are reset, and it is the amount of awards that players get at the end of the game that determine the winner of the game. Roll for the galaxy. 
Roll for the Galaxy is a space empire building dice game where players compete to try and build the most successful galactic civilization possible. In Roll for the Galaxy, players begin with a combination of a homeworld and faction tile. These govern the starting resources and a player's initial empire. Each die in the game represents a worker, and each color represents the die's specialty. Players each turn ultimately recruit workers from a citizenry by spending galactic credits, placing them in their dice cup, rolling the dice, and assigning them to a series of phases. These are chosen simultaneously by each player in secret until all dice have been assigned. One worker die is placed on the action phase strip that denotes an action that a player would like to perform, and all other dice are assigned in their retrospective columns below their corresponding phase symbols. Players here can choose to dictate and thus reassign a non-matching worker die under another symbol. Players then reveal their selections and flip over the activated phases. All players resolve the activated phases in numerical order simultaneously using the dice allocated in their own play area. In Explore, players either scout for a new tile or gain two credits. In Develop or Settle, players will develop or settle the top development world tile in the construction stack by paying its relevant cost. When players produce, they place a good on a non-grey world, trying to match the colours of the dice up with the world colours to try and score more victory points. When players ship, they trade a good using the conversion rates outlined in the book, or consume a good earning 1-3 to three victory point chips. Throughout the game, players will build a tableau of world and development cards earning, acquiring new dice, benefits, abilities, and actions. I always love Roll for the Galaxy because of the synergy that exists between the dice and the tiles in players' tableaus. I love how the different colours focus on different things. For example, the red military dice focus on developing technology and settling new worlds, whilst the purple consumption dice focus on shipping those goods, earning players important victory points. I like the light engine building um, elements to this game, as well as the different combination of tiles and starting worlds that players can get each time they play. Uh, leading to a very gameplay experience. Steampunk Rally Steampunk Rally is a card drafting dice placement board game where players take on the role of some of the world's greatest inventors as they build vehicles using various machine parts and then powering them with heat, steam and electrical dice before racing them against other inventors through the Swiss Alps. Players set up the desired racetrack, take corresponding light bulb, damage gauge and starting machine parts matching their chosen inventor. Players begin a round by drafting cards, by selecting one to keep and passing the rest around the group. Players can use their chosen card to either construct a machine part, discard their card to gain dice or cogs, or stash a boost card secretly. Players vent by spending cogs to reduce a certain number of dice pips. Players then race their machines by rolling dice in their dice pool, activating various machine part effects by placing dice in open dice slots and using their dice values and colours to ultimately generate motion to move their machine along the racetrack. Different machine parts have different effects including gaining extra cogs, dice, shields, movement and smooth movement effects. Players will have to balance optimizing their engines and navigating any obstacles on the way and minimizing any vehicle damage as best as they can to gain the lead. Steampunk Rally is ingeniously fun. It's dice and engine building at its very best. I love how the theme marries really well with the mechanics and as the game progresses and players improve their vehicles by adding machine parts, you players really get to see the synergy between the cards and the dice themselves. I like how players get to test their vehicles against the other vehicles that other players make by racing them along the racetrack and trying to navigate some of those really nasty obstacles. Discoveries, the Journals of Lewis and Clark. Discoveries, the Journals of Lewis and Clark is a dice rolling dice placement action selection game where players take on the role of either Lewis, Clark, Gas or Ordway as they retrace Lewis and Clark's historical expedition. Players will aim to try and fill up the Discovery Journal by garnering the greatest geographical, biological and ethnological knowledge possible. The main game board is divided into two main areas. The meeting area where three meeting tribe cards and discarded journal and negotiate dice are placed. And the reconnaissance area where three discovery cards and discarded walk and ride dice are placed. Each journal page card is double-sided. The Discovery side indicates the expedition paths from bottom to top that players need to complete. Any discovery points and any potential species, animals or plants living in the area explored. The tribe side may provide players with extra actions or permanent effects. Players essentially try to obtain these cards to help them win the game. On a player's turn, players can either choose to obtain all dice from the meeting area 
or all dice from the reconnaissance area, or recall five of their own same colored dice from anywhere on the game board, including an opponent player's game board. If players choose to play dice from their stock in their action zone, they must do so with at least one die and only with the same face type per turn. Some of the activated player board effects include taking a friendly tribe card, taking a weary tribe card, changing the faces of the dice in the dice pool, exchanging discovery card plans, riding a horse, hiking, crossing a mountain, or activating special actions found on tribe cards. Expeditions on discovery cards are completed when players pay the appropriate dice cost required to execute execute the total value and combination of hike ride mountaineering required actions in order to clear a string of mountain and river terrain icons that feature on a discovery card. I absolutely love Discovery's The Journals of Lewis and Clark due to its rich historical theme and interesting player interaction. I like the shared dice pool mechanic where players are constantly trying to use dice to try and activate particular actions on their player board. There's this beautiful tug of war effect as players try to reclaim their dice that have been used by other players or forcing other players to hand over a grey die when the shared pool of grey dice is completely uh, diminished. I like the light engine building aspect where players are using tribe cards to try and garner and activate extra actions to try and help them advance the game and obviously navigate and collect those discovery cards in order to earn victory points. Role player. Role play is a dice rolling set collection dice placement game where players compete to try and craft and build the greatest fantasy adventure character ever. This game takes the process of character creation for an RPG campaign and turns it into an immersive board game experience. In role player, players will essentially draft dice, place them on attribute rows on their character cards in order to meet certain numerical and color placement objectives on their character class cards and backstory cards. Each of the six attribute rows has a different special effect, allowing players to either flip dice, exchange them, increase and reduce their pip number, re-roll dice, move their alignment markers and their alignment cards, or gain charisma tokens to use in the market phase. Choosing the right die can be a very weighted decision, as players who opt for a higher die number will be pushed further back in initiative order, whilst players who choose lower die numbers can purchase first on the market track. Market cards provides the players with opportunities to collect sets of items, gain traits, purchase weapons, or even gain skills that may alter character's alignment and force them to the dark side. I like how each action that a player takes throughout the game is heavily weighted, needs to be pre-planned and calculated. There's a lot of mathematical and analytical thinking that is involved. Uh, there's a lot of uh, heavy decision making, so when players choose to draft a die with a higher pip number, that puts them further back in the initiative order when it comes to purchasing from the market track. I like how at the end of the game, players can reflect on the character that they've built, and taking it into an RPG campaign following the conclusion of the game is the logical next step. King of Tokyo. <laughs> King of Tokyo is a ferociously delicious dice chucking, card drafting, press your luck fighting game where players take in the role of Japanese inspired monsters as they fight King of the Hill style to become the greatest monster of all and thus King of Tokyo. Each player chooses a monster, sets its health to 10 and its victory points to 0. In turn order, players take turns rolling 6 big dice, setting aside any chosen dice and re-rolling the others up to 2 times before resolving the dice effects. After the final roll, if a player gains triple of any number, they get that many victory stars. If a player rolls a lightning bolt, they gain an energy cube per lightning bolt rolled. If a player rolls a heart, they can heal themselves one life point per heart roll. If a player rolls a pause symbol, they attack either the King of Tokyo if they're outside the city, or they attack all other players if they're King of Tokyo inside the city, equal to the value of number of pause symbols rolled. Players can then opt to purchase any number of cards from the market track using the respective number of energy cubes. These cards provide players with extra scoring abilities, actions, and trigger effects. The player who scores 20 victory points first, or is the last monster standing, wins. King of Tokyo is one of my favourite dice games of all time, and I always get it out when the family comes over. I really love the easy to learn rules and streamlined gameplay. I like the uh, fact that on a player's turn, players can place dice aside that they've rolled, and re-rolled the other dice to try and create combo effects. 
and earn an advantage in the game. It really helps players try and mitigate some of the luck factor when rolling dice. And we know that the dice obey nobody. I love the card combos in this game and uh, having those cards in your tableau or using the card effects can help your monster gain an advantage. And I really love the tug of war, take that effect between um, monsters that are on the outside trying to attack the monster who's the king of Tokyo on the inside and the king of Tokyo attacking all the monsters on the outside and the push your luck element of whether to stay as king of Tokyo or whether to try and uh, uh, surrender and then let someone else take over is really a balancing effect that players have to make throughout their game. Seasons. Seasons is a tactical dice and card game where players take in the role of wizards as they compete in the tournament of the 12 seasons held by some of the greatest sorcerers of the kingdom in the heart of Argos Forest as players try and vie for the title of the new Archmage of Zidid. The game begins with a draft known as the Prelude Phase, where players draft 9 power cards by selecting one and passing the hand of cards along. Players then use their 9 cards to construct 3 piles, each with 3 cards corresponding to the 3 years in which players wish to use them in the game. At the beginning of a round, the starting player rolls the corresponding season dice. Then players select a die in turn order, noting the symbols that appear on the die, and thus perform the actions of their selected season die. The star allows players to increase their summoning gauge, thus the number of cards allowed in play. The element symbols allows players to gain those as matching energy tokens. The number tells players how many crystals they've gained. The card outline allows players to draw a card from the deck. The circle allows players to transmute energy tokens into crystals using the current exchange rate on the central game board corresponding with the current season. The number of pips on the season's die that is not selected indicates the number of months that the season's marker will move around the central season's board track. Players can also summon or activate one or more of their power cards on their turn by paying the summoning cost at the bottom of the card and resolving any permanent or entering of play effects. I adore Seasons because I love discovering all the different card combos, chain effects and synergy that the cards and some of the dice have to offer. I like how when players pick a die, uh, some of the die faces actually give you several bonus effects. I like how this game can be adjusted for different difficulty experience levels and I like how drafting the die means you could be taking something that another player actually needs. This game comes with enough player controlled actions that allows you to mitigate some of the randomness that might rear its ugly head in the game. And I like how the die that isn't drafted determines the rate at which the seasons marker goes around the seasons track. A point to consider in this game is that the prelude phase at the beginning where players draft their nine cards is critically important for succeeding in the game. It's important that players play with someone of a similar ability and experience level in this game in order to ensure that each game feels balanced.